Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all, depending on the time zones you are in. So, welcome to the third webinar of Travelat Science Foundation. In fact, we can't call this as the third webinar because we had a series of online training program uh, webinars as part of the symposium. Anyway, just to introduce you to the foundation, Trevor Platt Science Foundation is an international organization dedicated to capacity building in science, research, and education related to the environment, especially our oceans, working towards the stewardship of our planet for future generations. Foundation was launched in 2021 by the colleagues, friends, and students of Professor Trevor Platt to, to celebrate his life and promote capacity building research and education in ocean sciences, and with a strong emphasis on network building, international networking, and also to nurture the next generation of young scientists and equip them to succeed in their chosen careers. And as you all remember, we had conducted an international symposium at Plymouth Marine Laboratory in August 2023 with more than 120 participants, and I see that many of you have joined here for the webinar as well. And many of the participants for the training, as well as the symposium attendees, they were gifted with pocket, uh, pocket held 3D printed mini Sekidis. So today we have Dr. Robert Bruin, or Bob Bruin, the designer of that mini and midi Sekidis, to give us a lecture. Dr. Bruin studied at the University of Plymouth for his undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral programs. He started his career at the University of Plymouth, moved on to Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and is now a senior lecturer in physical geography at the University of Exeter. He is a satellite oceanographer with keen interest in marine optics, phytoplankton, and modeling. At the same time, he loves to spend time in the field and has worked in lakes as well as open ocean from tropics to the poles. He is interested in citizen science as well and has developed this 3D printed mini Sekidis along with his brother, Tom Bruin. And you can see the photo, both the brothers. Bruin brothers continue to improve the mini and midi Sekidis and every time we meet, they come up with a new version of it through their company, Brutec Limited. Today, Bob will speak on the topic, reinvigorating historical methods for monitoring the optical properties of aquatic water. Welcome, Bob. Thank you very much, Nandini. You can hear me okay, yeah? Excellent. Um, well, firstly, thanks very much for inviting me to give this webinar. It's a real pleasure um, uh, to do this specifically um, for the Trevor Platt Science Foundation. I was fortunate enough to um, work with Trevor um, uh, uh, over the last during my period at Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and Trevor actually uh, had input to some of the work I'll be presenting here. So it's a real pleasure to give this webinar um, today. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about re reinvigorating historical methods for monitoring the optical properties of aquatic waters. This is a presentation I put together with my brother, Tom. Uh, he's based um, actually at uh, Chatham and Clarendon uh, Grammar School in Kent, uh, but is also uh, the, a managing director of a company um, he and I started up called Brutech Limited. Uh, this is the logo on the left here. Um, I'm based at the University of Exeter, um, as uh, Nandini um, mentioned, and I'm also supported by UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship, which um, uh, allows me to, to get on uh, with uh, research related to ocean color and uh, um, the optical properties of aquatic waters. So this folk, I. I don't very often have the pleasure of giving a presentation on behalf of myself and my brother. So I thought I'll throw, throw in a photo of us when we were younger growing up. Of course, this is um, was quite a long time ago now. This is, oh, bear with me. This is what we look like now, um, about 35 years later. Uh, here we are um, sampling some uh, Chinese liquor, actually. My um, postdoc, Sharon, uh, kindly gave me as a birthday present. Um, uh, getting a little bit giggly, and you can see we've grown up a lot in the last 35 years. Okay, so before I, I get on with the subject, um, I just want to uh, recognise a variety of 
people uh, who have helped um, with this work. Um, it's been a really large community effort. First, starting um, uh, on the left here with uh, Shuba and Trevor, who have supported this work right from its outset. Uh, our colleagues in India, Nandini, Grinson and Anis, um, and a whole range of colleagues, citizens, scientists, students who have helped uh, with the citizen science based work we've uh, been doing in India. We've also got involved with the um, uh, European Union Monocle project with support from Stefan Simis, uh, uh, Norbert and Tom Jackson. Been working with uh, Lars Brunner a little bit up in Scotland, uh, um, testing some of our devices. Uh, we have a nice project I'll be talking about, um, working uh, with colleagues in the US. This is Phil Bresnahan, um, Troy Friendsley and Delaney, who have been supporting us. Um, uh, getting feedback and input from colleagues, uh, uh, Giorgio Delolmo and Dionysius Reitzos here. This is my group over on the, uh, in the top right here, um, Ui, Sharon, Johan and Isabel. Also been working uh, with a lot of undergraduate students um, uh, because some of the devices we've been developing are very useful for teaching. Uh, Keely Davis particularly has been helping out. Um, uh, Joe Wood has come on board as well um, in the project we're working with Phil uh, to help out with some of this work. Uh, thank also a lot of the students at, uh, at Clarendon and Chatham House Grammar School who have been helping construct some of the devices. And finally, a big effort from other members of the Bruin family here. My mum and dad who have uh, been uh, putting together a lot of these devices, support my auntie Barbara. And this is my daughter Phoebe and, and my niece um, here testing out some of the, 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 the devices. And many, many more people have been supporting us. It's been a really big community effort uh, with this work. OK, so outline of this webinar, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the history of ocean and lake colour and clarity. Uh, I'm then going to talk a little bit about why uh, it's important to study ocean, lake and um, uh, so I'm just going to close that ocean, lake, colour uh, and clarity, why it's important. I'm going to move on to talking a bit about the Secchi disc, uh, the Pharrell colour scale, and then finally talking a bit about some of the technology that we've been developing um, uh, as part of Brutec and um, LCD. OK, so just to kick it off, um, ocean cut and lake colour uh, has um, inspired um, artists and poets for a long period of time. These are just some examples of uh, getting a little bit of feedback here. I don't know if you can mute your um, audio. I'll push on anyway. Uh, but these are examples of some paintings from 19th century artists here just illustrating how color the color of the ocean inspired uh, much of the artwork uh, um, uh, over the period uh, the color and the clarity of the water also was found out to be important for early navigation purposes um, navigators of the uh, world's oceans found that the color of the ocean uh, and its clarity gave important information about the bottom topography which of course was very important um, uh, for navigation, the presence of icebergs, uh, river discharge. Um, there was work suggesting or um, uh, navigators were noting that the occurrence of more productive waters, whether that be fish or seabirds, um, often happened when the waters became greener. And of course, the recovery of goods lost at sea is dependent very much on the uh, clarity of the water. So there's many examples of people talking about the colour and the clarity of the water uh, throughout history with respect to early navigation. Very nice book put together by the late Marcel Vernand um, and colleagues uh, here, Ocean Optics from 1600 to 1930. Um, uh, if you'd like to learn a bit more about this history um, of ocean uh, and lake colour, I can't actually get my hands on a copy of this book, but um, Marcel Bernard's PhD thesis is freely available uh, through ResearchGate here, through this link at the bottom here, and contains a lot of information, a lot of history behind uh, uh, ocean and lake colour and clarity. But it was um, really first um, established as a, um, uh, a a discipline or in, in a way as by, by an Indian scientist by the name of Raman who studied the colour of the sea. And it was only until the sort of early 19th century, um, there were a lot of uh, 
discussions going on within the field of what actually constitutes the colour of the ocean. Um, a prominent British scientist at the time, Lord Rayleigh, um, uh, was arguing that the colour of the ocean or the colour of the water looks blue because it's simply reflecting the skylight. But it was Roman who uh, proved um, in, in work in the um, early 20th century that the um, optical properties of water um, are actually blue. Um, and he did this by um, using a, a sort of prism device that he just put below the surface of the water um, in order to eliminate uh, any uh, sky uh, light being reflected at the surface from the sky and showed that the waters um, uh, that he was studying in the Mediterranean were very, very blue. And I'm sort of just going to describe why that is here. So um, R here the, um, is uh, the reflected light. So it's a basically a ratio of uh, upwelling light to downwelling light, the reflectance. And this is roughly proportional to the uh, backscattering um, uh, divided by the absorption. And if we look at the optical properties of pure water, we can see that pure water absorbs a lot of light in the red wavelengths, relatively large amount of light in green wavelengths with minimum absorption in blue wavelengths. Alternatively, due partly to molecular scattering, um, pure water uh, scatters light um, at higher, uh, backscatters light um, higher at blue wavelengths and less so in green and red wavelengths. As a result, the reflectance of uh, pure water is very blue. And we found that out ourselves when we uh, went and did a research expedition uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. We went out to some of the most oligotrophic regions of our ocean where there is pretty much nothing in the water beside, or very little in the water. And the waters are strikingly blue, as you can see in this image here. This is a radi radiometric device we deployed um, uh, off our vessel here, which measures the reflected light just below the sea surface. And this is just a plot of that reflected light. Um, so we have wavelength on the x-axis here going from about 400 to 800 nanometers. So your blues to your greens to your reds. And we can see uh, how strong the uh, signal is, the reflectance is in the blue wavelengths relative to green and red. But of course, if we um, look at ocean and lake uh, waters all around the world, whether that's out in the centre of the oligotrophic gyre or whether that's um, you know in a pond, we can see a vast array of different colours. Sometimes it's blue, sometimes it's blue-green, sometimes it's strikingly green, it can be brownie green, it can be bright brown, it can even be sort of darky orangey yellow. So we have this whole array of colors that we observe uh, when we look at the water. And so why is that? Well, the reason is quite simple, actually, uh, that uh, the water parcel we're looking at doesn't just contain water. It also contains other substances, particles and dissolved substances. And so if we're looking at an ocean that doesn't really have anything in it, it's going, the reflected light we see is going to be very blue because um, as I just described earlier, pure water, the molecule pure water um, is very blue in color. But if we add particles to that water mass, if we add phytoplankton, which absorb a lot of light in the blue wavelengths, they've actually adapted to absorb light in the blue wavelengths because um, of ev evolutionary purposes, um, they turn the waters very green. If we put sediments in the water, non-algal particles, they can turn the waters very brown. Um, if we add dissolved substances from uh, river runoff, humic and fluvic acids and things like that into the water, they can turn it very yellowy, orangey even in some cases. So why is ocean colour important? Well, the first reason is it can tell us about the composition and the concentration of particles and substances in the water. And this can be useful for a whole range of applications. If the waters are very green, as I mentioned, um, they can uh, uh, turn, they, they, it can be indicative of high concentrations of phytoplankton in the water, both in terms of the types of phytoplankton potentially, but also their biomass. This can be important for studying biogeochemical cycles in lakes and in oceans. If, they if the waters are very brown, it can be indicative of high concentrations of sediments in the water. Uh, this can be useful for studying coastal erosion, uh, sediment dynamics and river runoff. 
if the waters are sort of very dark yellowy, yellowy, um, it can be indicative of high amounts of dissolved organic matter. Uh, can be uh, dissolved organic carbon, so it could be important for studying the carbon cycle between the land and the ocean, um, and can also be uh, used for tracing um, river runoff and things like that. So, by studying the color and learning um, and inferring the composition and concentration of particles and substances. We can uh, study interesting dynamics related to biogeochemical cycles, coastal erosion, uh, and the carbon cycle, for example. Now, the other reason why it's important to study ocean and lake color is that light is the primary energy source that drives the marine ecosystem through primary production by phytoplankton. So at the bottom of the food web, we have um, our phytoplankton in the ocean that convert light um, uh, uh, using CO2 and light uh, uh, to produce organic uh, carbon. Now, these phytoplankton, through photosynthesis, modify the CO2 concentration of the surface of the ocean, causing a disequilibrium, actually. So uh, reducing the CO2 concentrations at the very surface of the ocean. And that can actually promote air-sea gas exchange of CO2. So phytoplankton are very important in um, modulating the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And because they're at the bottom of the food web, um, the uh, amount of phytoplankton produced has implications for the higher trophic levels, the zooplankton that eat the phytoplankton, um, the fish that eat the zooplankton or the larvae that eat the zooplankton and so on and so forth, all the way up to human beings through seafood that we eat. So studying light or understanding light in the ocean is really important for uh, um, a whole variety of reasons described here. And in order to understand light in the ocean, we need to um, understand water clarity as it's critical for modulating light availability. Water clarity also impacts visibility uh, in the ocean. This can have implications for other um, uh, higher trophic levels, for example, fish, uh, zooplankton uh, and other animals. Um, it impacts their ability to see prey and predators. Water clarity and colour um, is often used as a proxy for uh, water quality. Uh, certainly where I live um, in the southwest of the UK, um, often when it rains a lot, they open the storm drains. And so a lot of um, uh, pollution for, uh, runs off the land into the, in, into the uh, ocean and it modifies its, the colour and the clarity of the ocean. So these can be good proxies for, for where this um, a river runoff uh, uh, goes. Um, and uh, indicator of water quality. And it also impacts uh, human perceptions of water bodies. And this can uh, have implications for tourism, for example, and even uh, well-being. So these are just some of the examples why, why it's important to study the, the clarity and the color of the ocean. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, one of the first techniques to um, sort of standardize method to uh, measure the clarity of the ocean was developed um, or, or sort of pioneered by um, Angelo Secchi um, in the mid to late uh, 19th century. So uh, he uh, developed the first standardized method for determining water clarity, and this came to be known as the Secchi disk. Angelo Secchi actually was a astronomer by background, and um, he was a rather prolific scientist and contributed many fundamental studies uh, in astronomy. Um, uh, let alone his contributions to ocean optics. So how do uh, how does the Secchi disk work? Well, this sort of image here illustrates um, uh, how it works. So you lower a white disk into the water and the depth at which it disappears from sight is measured. And this is proportional to the clarity of the water. Now, if, um, if we study uh, or, or look into the history of uh, this technique, there is actually examples of um, researchers doing this much earlier than, than um, when Angelo Secchi developed his standardized method. If you look into the 17th, 18th and 19th century, researchers have documented the clarity of the water uh, being measured uh, in a similar way by lowering glass vases, red cloths and white plates into the water. Uh, in order to, to get a proxy for its clarity. And even using a white disc had been known before uh, Angelo Secchi came along. However, the experiments performed by Secchi, the rigorous um, uh, 
an intensive scale um, studies that that he did um, really led to this method being called the Secchi disk depth me method. And there's a couple of very nice papers, uh, one by Marcel Bernard um, in, in 2011 and uh, one by Oliver Zielinski in 2020, describing more of the history around the Secchi disk, if you're, if you're interested in learning a bit more about that. Another paper also, uh, which was published quite re recently by Hamy Pichach, um, actually studied some of the early measurements collected by Angelo Secchi. And what was um, striking again, which I mentioned in the previous slide, is how rigorous some of these early um, uh, uh, scientific research um, expeditions were. So he, um, Anglo Secchi, studied the effect of disk size, for example, on the Secchi depth readings. He also looked at the effect of sun elevation uh, and various other environmental factors that can impact the Secchi disk uh, depth measurement. One of the things that sort of really um, establishes this method and why it has this sort of longevity um, is uh, because actually the technique provides a remarkably stable result, given the fact that sea state and meteorological conditions can vary widely, as does the observer's technique itself. So, yes, all of these environmental factors, disk size, sun angle, um, and so on and so forth, um, differences in perception between individuals does have an impact on the Secchi depth reading, um, but it's actually remarkably stable uh, uh, um, despite all of those factors. Joseph Lutz um, in uh, um, ex expeditions um, in the late 19th century, used the Secchi disk during uh, the, the polar expedition in the Mediterranean Red Seas. One of my master's students actually has, um, in collaboration with Hamid Pichach and uh, Dionysius Reitzos, has been studying some of these early measurements here. This is just a plot on the right here of um, the Secchi depth measurements collected uh, during a period between about 1890 and 1900. Uh, and Jonathan Heath, uh, um, my master's student here, has been looking at um, uh, how the colour and the cl clarity of the waters changed uh, from these early expeditions compared to recent years. Uh, so it, it really started to take off uh, in the late 19th century. And the method has been continued to be used throughout the 20th century. And even with the advent of satellite remote sensing of ocean colour, which has allowed us to view the clarity and the colour of the oceans on very wide scales, the method has continued to be um, uh, used, owing partly due to its robust nature, and it's also a cheap, very low cost method of measuring the water uh, clarity. So this is an example of a plot, uh, again, taken from Oliver uh, Zielinski's pa paper in 2020, and shows the data set of marine Secchi depth information from 1895 to present, um, uh, based on this website. I Iron water. And you can see this global distribution of intensive observations of Secchi depth, principally in northern latitudes um, around the world. And this continues um, to this day, uh, specific, uh, specifically through developments in, uh, for instance, mobile phones. So there's now apps that you can download where you can log your Secchi depth measurement and it can contribute to these large global databases. Now, out in the open ocean, um, far sort of far away from or fairly far away from land, the optical properties of the water um, are often controlled principally by the phytoplankton in the water. It's they're often referred to as case one waters, where the optical properties uh, co-vary in a predictable manner with the uh, uh, abundance of phytoplankton in the ocean. And in such cases, the Secchi depth measurement can actually be a very good proxy of the abundance of phytoplankton in the water. And I'm just showing you an example of that. This is from some recent work that we published based on four open ocean research cruises as part of the Atlantic Meridional Transect here, AMT 23 through to 28. And we collected Secchi depth observations in the open ocean uh, shown here. Uh, uh, we put our Secchi disk on our optics rig. We also collected um, a radiometric measurements, very precise measurements of ocean color here. Uh, and we, we collected uh, um, a measured phytoplankton abundance or the chlorophyll concentration in phytoplankton, which is a proxy for their abundance using high performance liquid chromatography. And what we found is that the Secchi depth 
uh, actually is a very good predictor of the chlorophyll concentration and only explains 4% less variance than uh, our very precise hyperspectral radometer. So it just demonstrates how um, useful the Secchi depth measurement is in the open ocean as a proxy for phytoplankton in abundance. And this has been known about for a while. Um, and for example, back in 2010, uh, um, a paper was published in Nature where they uh, combined uh, transparency or Secchi depth observations going back uh, to the 1900 with modern in situ observations of chlorophyll concentration, our proxy for phytoplankton by abundance, in order to study how phytoplankton have changed over the last century. Uh, some subsequent papers also published by Daniel Boyce uh, um, in 2012 and 2014. And the picture was rather grim. It uh, seemed to imply that the phytoplankton abundance has declined quite significantly in um, uh, uh, many areas of the ocean over the past century. And this was due, part, due to uh, the historic uh, Secchi depth uh, observations that have been collected, amongst other data sets that have been integrated into this work. Not only in the oceans, but the Secchi disk uh, is has been used frequently over the past sort of 50 years in lakes. This is just an example of uh, some work that was pub that was uh, published in PLUS One um, in the uh, northeastern uh, United States, where they um, compiled a data set of uh, 34 years in length of Secchi disk observations uh, in lakes. Uh, to study temporal trend, trends uh, in late clarity. And there's also this very popular Secchi Dep Dipping project, which has started in about 1994. And once a year, um, uh, vast numbers of volunteers go out and measure the Secchi depth in lakes uh, in the US. And this is a uh, data set is being used to study changes in late clarity. Um, and even with the advent of satellite remote sensing, um, which allows us to monitor wide areas of uh, color and clarity in the oceans and in lakes, the Secchi disk measurement is still proven very useful, uh, partly as a validation tool for the satellite algorithms that are being developed, um, allowing us to use these satellite products more confidently and also track any changes in the stability um, uh, and in the calibrations uh, uh, of the Secchi disk uh, algorithms. Now, the second technique uh, I'm going to talk about is another technique developed in the late 19th century, and that uh, has been come to known as the Frel Uhl color scale. And it was developed by two scientists um, uh, uh, during the late 19th century. Francis Froel, who proposed a standard set of colors uh, determining uh, blue to green waters uh, in 1890. And this was further ex extended by Wilhelm Uhl um, uh, to include blue to green to brown waters, essentially extending it into more uh, coastal waters and in, into lakes. And basically the technique was developed um, by producing a series of vials, which um, consisted of a combination of blue, yellow and brown solutions, each of which were um, developed using various uh, compounds and elements um, as uh, uh, described here. And combining these solutions um, uh, together, uh, they created this color scale going from blues to greens to yellows to browns, known as the Frel color scale. And typically, um, one used this color, color scale in combination with a Secchi uh, disk. So what they, you would do is you'd go out and measure your Secchi depth. You would then raise the disk to half the Secchi depth, look at the color of the disk, and then uh, choose the color uh, on the scale that the uh, disc color is closest to. So if I was looking at this disc here, I'd probably pick, pick out a yellowy brown, maybe um, 18, 17, 18, 19 here, um, just as an example. So this technique was um, sort of pioneered in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and it was used on a variety of expeditions or research cruises. One particular uh, example of this is the, the famous Plankton exp Expedition uh, by Crummel, where um, the, the German scientists went out um, into the North Sea and basically did a cruise track around the Northern Atlantic. 
measuring the plankton abundance using nets at the time, but they also measured the color of the water as well and produced maps of um, uh, water color based on this little color scale. This is one of my fav fav favorite maps. Um, it was a, another a, a map, this, this being of, of the entire Atlantic though, that was developed at the turn of the um, 19th, 20th century. Uh, using a, um, a large database of felt rule uh, discrete measurements collected in the Atlantic Ocean. And what you can see in this um, map is some distinctive regions in the ocean uh, of very blue waters here in the North and South Atlantic, greener waters in the equatorial regions and greener waters at the high latitudes. Um, and what's striking is that the map from these discrete measurements of frel or color corresponds remarkably well with a uh, satellite image of ocean color uh, collected in the modern era. So it just emphasizes um, how useful these discrete measurements of color are, that were taken um, by different individuals visually are in uh, 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 seeing these patterns in color in the ocean. And much like the Secchi depth observations, there's now vast databases uh, that date back to the late 19th century. Um, uh, this is just one uh, example from a paper by Vernand um, in 2013, where, which is a couple of hundred thousand observations of frel ulb color. And just like the Secchi depth, modern tools are being developed to uh, continue the time series of these measurements utilizing mobile phones, uh, for example, in the top, or even developing uh, hardware tools, uh, modern versions of the Frel all color scale shown um, uh, in the bottom right here. And with these long uh, term data sets on ocean color, uh, they all have also been used to study changes in color, um, particularly in light of anthropogenic climate change. Satellite algorithms have also been developed to um, uh, to estimate the frel ul color, um, which can allow us to continue the time series of uh, frel ul color observations um, now into the future. And of course, look at this color scale on much larger uh, spatial scales. Okay, so. Well, one thing that we found um, when we were utilizing some of these tools, specifically the Secchi disk, is that um, from collecting observations using a standard Secchi disk um, and for our color scale unit, we found it could be quite cumbersome sometimes. You typically are using a large rope, quite a large disk, it can be hard to carry. And so we felt that we there's potential to re reinvigorate the design of the Secchi disk and for our color with the goal to make it smaller, maybe even pocket size in some cases, more ergonomic, lightweight, and easy to use, and conse consequently more accessible to a wide range of users. We were particularly interested in um, making the operation of the device easier in smaller water bod bodies um, and from smaller uh, watercraft and platforms. Uh, and initially, we were thinking about targeting lakes and turbid waters, uh, partly because the Secchi depths, as shown on the top right here, uh, are, are typically much shallower in, in lake and, and nearshore regions uh, than in, in the open ocean. And so uh, if we want to miniaturize this device, uh, we, we don't necessarily need such a long tape. And this is sort of uh, the... Um, the roadmap of how we, 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 we did that. We started with the standard Secchi desk here shown on the left, and we just started to begin tinkering it, tinkering, tinkering with it. Um, so we played around with making the disc collapsible, using different tape measures, even using chalk lines that builders use. Um, and eventually we sort of honed in on, on, on a nice design here and then um, began to, to redesign the device um, using a, a 3D printer as a manufacturing tool, finishing with our product at the end here. And we published this work openly in a paper in 2019 uh, in the journal Sensors. And this is, was, was the first uh, prototype of our device here. Uh, you can see an exploded drawing of it here. Basically, you have the tape in the middle. It's just simply like a tape measure. 3D printed shell uh, with a bobbin handle, um, uh, a finger strap and a lanyard here. 
um, with our white disc, we chose a uh, disc size to be 10 centimeters because we're focusing mainly initially on um, more turbid waters with our weight here um, uh, to sink it. Now, following that initial design, we have in, um, done more work on it, um, got feedback from users within projects I'll be talking about in a minute. And we've modified the design slightly now, bringing some of the fixings on the outside of the devices so we can fit more tape uh, in here. Now, all of these designs uh, are openly available, um, the original ones through the publication and the um, new ones that we've uh, improved are available on this website um, here. So our whole um, uh, uh, approach to designing uh, this uh, device has been to make it completely openly available. It's relatively easy to operate. Uh, you simply uh, pop your hand in the lanyard. You then push out the weight of the device um, here, slip a finger into um, your finger strap. Um, you pull the uh, handle back and you can easily wind the device up and down. And you measure the Secchi depth in the same way um, uh, as a standard Secchi depth measurement is, is collected. Essentially, you're looking at this distance here. So this is the distance uh, between the, the disappearance slash reappearance of the disc. We've just set that to be equal in, the, in this example here. You're looking at the distance between that point and the very surface. You could measure that directly by looking at the tape at the very surface, or if you're slightly high up, you can measure the distance um, between where you're deploying it and the surface and subtract that from a total distance here. Now, commonly, the, the or traditionally, the uh, Secchi depth is um, computed by measuring the point at which the disk disappears and then the point at which it reappears uh, and then taking the average of the two. Often I found that um, uh, they're very close um, uh, in distance and sometimes can be the same, but traditionally one measures the depth at which it disappears and then when it reappears and takes the average. Now, in terms of your tips for good deployment, uh, one thing that's very important is this, the disc must sink vertically through the water column to uh, get an accurate reading of the second depth. Strong currents or boat movement may cause the disc to sink at, at slight angles, causing inaccurate readings. And so it's very important in many cases uh, uh, where, where the waters, um, you have currents, even low to moderate currents, to add additional weight to the Secchi disc. So we have a standard weight on the mini Secchi disc, and it will sink vertically in completely still waters. Uh, but if you go into currents, you do need to add a little bit of weight. Uh, and you can use just a standard fishing weight that you can buy from any local fishing shop and a little bit of a weight att attachment tackle and add that. When you're making the measurement, it's always good to look for deeper waters because, of course, um, uh, if you're trying to make the me measurement in waters that are shallower than the Secchi depth, then, then you're, you're, the disc isn't going to disappear. Um, so it's always good to look for deeper water. I recommend trying to avoid shadows as that can impact your Secchi depth reading. Try to avoid sun glint as it can sort of uh, saturate your eyes a little bit, making it quite hard to um, see the disc. It can be hard to avoid that. I have collected observations right at the equator when the sun is directly overhead and there's no way you can kind of avoid it. Um, uh, but try to avoid it if you can. Uh, allow a little bit of time for your eyes to adapt near the Secchi, uh, adapt to the, the disc near the Secchi depth. Um, uh, I found that's quite important. The closer you make the measurement to midday, the better, uh, though uh, it's always good to log the time um, you collect the data and therefore or we can always um, filter the data or you can always filter the data by looking at the sun angle uh, as a function of time and knowing the location. And it's good to always repeat the measurements if you can, that improves the precision. So that's just some sort of good tip, tips uh, to, to use a Secchi disk. In terms of the color, as I mentioned, um, one what typically measures the Secchi depth and then brings the disc up to half the Secchi depth uh, shown here and then uh, looks at the, the color of the disc relative to the color scale. This is just an example of some colors here where you have a deeper Secchi depth. You go to the half here and then you select the color closest uh, to um, the you think the color of the disc. 
Now, this color scale is based on the um, RGB colors that were proposed by uh, Marcel Vernon in his 2013 paper um, and is, again, uh, freely down downloadable from the uh, paper that we published or from the website. Okay, so some examples of, of uh, projects where we've been using this device. Well, we are uh, strongly indebted to many of our Indian colleagues who um, helped really um, uh, kick things off uh, with the mini Seki disc. We produced 100 of these devices for uh, this uh, revival project, which was a UK joint UK-Indian project looking at the um, water quality in Lake Bembanand in uh, Kerala in, in India. Uh, and 100 of these devices were distributed to scientists, to students and some citizens uh, all across the lake where they collected uh, nearly a thousand um, uh, measurements of uh, clarity and color. And uh, these data were then uh, calibrated to um, uh, to turbidity measurements or some discrete turbidity measurements in order to map the turbidity of the lake over large scales. And this data was subsequently used uh, in the project to actually look at water quality um, uh, in the lake. As part of that project um, as well, uh, we there was work uh, looking at satellite remote sensing of uh, some of the Frelul color products uh, and data collected from the mini Seki disk was used to evaluate some of the satellite products. And in this case, what we found is that the satellite products were producing a greener uh, Frelul color than uh, what the many of the in situ observations were suggesting. Uh, this was work by Gemma Kulk uh, published in, in 2021. In one very interesting study uh, led by uh, Nandini, um, uh, there was a situation where a, two buildings were demolished on the edge of the lake. And this was because they were illegally constructed. And so um, were, it was decided that they needed to be demolished. And when they were demolished, as you can see in this picture in the center here, they released a huge amount of material into the lake. And the students and scientists and some of the citizens um, measured the Seki disc depth and the felt wall color for the week, uh, weeks after um, uh, this building was demolished. And they found that actually it takes around five weeks, took around five weeks for the lake to go back to um, uh, uh, conditions um, pre-demolition. So when this material went into the lake, basically it reduced the clarity of the lake considerably and made the waters brown. And it took about five weeks for them to go back to pre-existing levels. Another project where the mini Seki disc um, uh, was adopted was uh, in the um, EU Monocle project. This was a project which was aiming at um, looking at developing low cost and high autonomy sensors and platforms for optical water quality monitoring so the mini Seki disc alongside a whole range of other tools that were being developed were tested in this project this is an example of tom jackson deploying one of the the, the Seki discs um in a pond actually um uh, uh in the monocle project uh, and the date within that project as well um i didn't mention actually in the earlier projects um a revival project a phone app was developed that allowed the citizens to log the data this was called turb aqua um, uh, in India, it allowed the citizens to log the data and that the data was then sent to a server geolocated um, uh, um, in, in the database. And similarly to that, uh, a, a phone app was developed within the Monocle project. Um, uh, this phone app also worked on Apple as well as Android based platforms. Um, and it was part of a suite of phone apps that they were developing um, for other uh, sensors within the project. Um, and citizens can log their, their, their observations. And, and some of these devices were, were distributed all around Europe and in Africa as well, and have got out into the Americas within that project, um, allowing the users to um, uh, log their data and up, update that onto a central server that we can then access and, and, and use it for scientific applications. Another project uh, that's just kicked off, well, it kicked off about a year ago, um, uh, but we're just starting really to get on with the citizen science aspect of that is the um, SOCOM project. Uh, so within the SOCOM project, this is really focusing on a CubeSat called Seahawk uh, or Hawkeye, 
Uh, so it's a small uh, ocean color satellite that was launched a few years ago, uh, designed to measure ocean color. Um, and we have a, a work package within that project involve, that involves distributing around 100 of these mini Secchi disks to citizens in the US and using that data to evaluate uh, satellite products from Seahawk and Hawkeye, as well as other satellites, um, uh, high resolution satellites like Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8. And this is just some of the work that's starting to come out of that project here. This is a, a give credit to, to Leon here, who um, who visited me in Exeter um, uh, a few months back and uh, helped uh, has been helping develop Seki Depth and for all color products for Hawkeye. Um, and the we're distributing these mini Seki disks to citizens now and planning to use the data to evaluate the um, precision and the accuracy in some of these products. Okay, so um, that's a little bit about the product itself that we've been developing and some of the projects uh, it's been used in. If you are at all interested in the product, uh, we have been uh, building them. We have sort of uh, various uh, ways of distribu distributing them. Firstly, the, um, the devices, the uh, files, um, all are all freely available and da downloadable. So um, anyone is uh, who has access to a 3D printer and basic workshop tools uh, can download the files and build one if they wanted. Uh, we've also uh, looking to produce 3D print your own builder kits. So if you have access to a 3D printer, uh, but maybe not some of the other tools that, that are needed, um, uh, to build other parts, you can buy these kits, print the bot the 3D printed components and then put it together, or we've been selling them whole. Um, we have two versions of the a device at the moment. We have a mini Secchi disc with a 10 meter tape that's pocket sized, most suitable for lakes and turbid waters. We also have a 3D printed MIDI Secchi disc with a longer tape, about 20 meters here, which is suitable for clear lakes and coastal waters. We're selling these at around uh, about 95 to 100 pounds, 105 pounds. Um, what we're finding is actually 3D printing is absolutely fantastic for designing, uh, developing um, and improving the design, but it's not so good for um, large scale manufacture. Um, and to do that, we need, really need to look at other manufacturing um, uh, processes. And we have been doing that. Um, we've just got the green light on producing an injection molded version of the product. Uh, the first um, mini and midi Secchi disc will be available in early 2024. And owing to the costs um, um, or the significant cost reduction in components, um, these devices will be a lot cheaper than the 3D printed ones that we're selling at the moment. And so this is a collaboration we have with Hornby Hobby in Kent. Now, as I mentioned, all the designs are open source, um, share and share alike um, uh, based software, both in terms of the hardware and the software that we've been been developing. Um, so they are completely open for for um, uh, commercial as well as research based purposes. Uh, we're constantly looking for feedback. Um, we really value the community um, uh, buy-in that we've had so far with, uh, with our device. Um, and we're constantly looking to improve the design uh, through community engagement. And this is just one example of some of the, the designs that we've been toying with now. This is an example of a mechanism that we've put with, within the body of the mini Secchi disc which may allow us to use a wire rather than a tape and still record the distance directly from the device. Another thing that we've been playing with, um, and we've just submitted a paper on this actually uh, um, uh, last week, uh, this work was presented at the Trevor Platt Science Foundation, is we've been looking to integrate a, a, an environmental electronic based environmental sensor package into the disk. So uh, this is one of the prototypes that we have here where we have a spectral irradiance sensor on the surface, we have a pressure sensor and a temperature sensor um, at the bottom of the device, and it can be used uh, to um, uh, collect profiles of temperature and spectral light. Uh, the device is charged and transfers data wirelessly uh, and is operated by a magnet key. Um, so stay tuned if you're interested in that. Hopefully we'll get the paper through to publication. And again, the plan is to make all the designs open source. 
So I'm going to stop there. I think that should give us a little bit of time for questions. Uh, thank you very much for listening. If you need to get in contact with me, this is my email here. Uh, also, my brother's um, email is at the bottom there. Um, and certainly if you're interested in, in getting your hands on any of the uh, tools that we've been developing and sharing in this um, uh, webinar, uh, then please do, do, do contact us. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing um, now. I'm not going to, yep. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And we have time for two quick questions. And we do have more than two questions. I'll ask the first one. You can check in the Q&A box. That is, first one is by an anonymous attendee. That is, what is the correlation between Secchi disk measurements, turbidity, and particle backscatter? Can you recommend any articles pertaining to these subjects? Okay. Um, yes. So... The topic of Secchi depth theory is something that's been um, studied for a long time, but has been reinvigorated a little bit in recent years. Uh, so there's a lot of work. Um, I recommend two papers, firstly, one paper um, uh, published by Presendorfer in uh, the late 80s. I'll find a link and dump it in the chat um, uh, um, in a moment. Also, another paper by Zongping Li that was published in 2015, so more recently. And now what these um, these work, what this work does is it studies the relationship between Secchi disk depth and directly the optical properties of the water. So in the uh, traditional Secchi depth theory, it was thought that the Secchi dip, if you can account for um, various factors, uh, including the eye brain uh, system, but uh, factors uh, I mean by surface reflection, you can directly relate the Secchi disk depth to the sum of the beam attenuation coefficient and the diffuse attenuation coefficient. And that is um, light integrated in those two optical properties over the photopic range because our human eye is tuned uh, to see more green light with higher sens sensitivity than red or, or blue light. Um, so you within that theory, you can directly relate the Secchi disk depth to the sum of the beam attenuation coefficient, which is an inherent optical property, and the diffuse attenuation coefficient, which is an apparent optical property, so influenced by the um, angular structure of the light. Um, so that that is um, the the traditional Secchi depth theory. However, more recent work by Zongping Li um, has argued that the Secchi disk depth is actually directly related to the diffuse attenuation coefficient and not so much the, the beam attenuation coefficient. Uh, so I will pop those papers in the um, a, a Q&A um, or in the chat somewhere. Um, uh, I recommend having a good look at those both. Um, but there, as I say, there are a lot of theories out there that directly relate the Secchi depth to these um, um, uh, optical properties. You can also develop empirical relationships. So you mentioned turbidity and particle backscattering there. So if you are studying your own lake, for instance, or, or, or region, you can collect turbidity measurements and Secchi depth measurements and uh, establish empirical relationships between the two. A bit like what we did in uh, um, the revival pro project uh, in Kerala. Um, is that answer the question? I hope so. Yes, yes. And there is a second part also. Yeah. Uh, that is, are there any cost effective or dependable equipment for estimating remote sensing reflectance? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's a lot of exciting developments in this area happening as well. Um, so one of them is using mobile phone cameras. So very nice work been published recently. Um, well, actually, over the last sort of 10, 15 years, uh, phone apps have been developed, like Hydrocolor app, for example, uh, which allows you to estimate the remote sensing reflectance uh, using mobile phone cameras. Um, a lot of work, again, in the Monocle project where they developed this iSpect, which is a device that you attach to um, your phone camera and allows you to get more precise spectral information on the reflected light. Now, it's, there are um, certain protocols you need to follow in order to position your camera um, at the uh, ocean or lake surface at certain angles with the sun in, certain, in, in the correct positions and so on and so forth. But there are a lot of exciting developments in that area as well. 
Um, we've also been playing a little bit with these uh, spectral light sensors that we've been putting on the Seki disk. So we're we're playing with something at the moment where we put two of the light sensors, one looking up, one looking down, and essentially you can then profile and get remote sen uh, get irradiance reflectance essentially with that that technique. So yes, a lot of exciting developments in that area. Yeah, thank you. And we have a question from Urias Taylor. He has asked, why do we tend to see watercolor to be black? in the near eye infrared oh that's that is primarily um pure water absorption so if you look at the um up, uh, absorption coefficient of pure water it ramps up in the near infrared so as a result all the light that's entering that near surface gets absorbed very quickly and the waters look very dark at that wavelength yeah thank you and Umam Maheshwar Rao has asked, why for a yield scale, sir? Already quantification algorithms are developed. Yes, yeah, so um, really it's the history, right? So if you go back to um, the late 19th century, 1890, uh, there wasn't a lot of electronic-based instruments around or theory around the color of, of the ocean so, or, or lakes. So it was these vials that were produced by by, by Farrell and all uh, developed to to standardize colors that you can then be used to look visually at the color, uh, which, which is why uh, why it's used. And, and why is it continually used today is because we have this long record of measurements going back uh, in time. So if we can continue to collect that information on on, on Farrell all color, then we can build this long time series of observations um, over the last century and beyond to study changes in color and clarity um, in our lakes and our oceans. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we have a question from Antonella. Really nice presentation related to things to avoid when performing these measurements. Does the distance between the observer and the water affect the observations when measuring from a dock? This distance can be five meter. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I I suspect it does. Now, whether that um, error is significant um, in relation to all the other errors that can go into your Seki depth measurement uh, is something I think that could be worth a nice little experiment to test, to be honest. Um, so if, you know, you could think of a sort of ladder or something can, uh, or, or, or well, of course, you know, get it through risk assessment and health and safety first. Um, but that's something that could easily be test tested. I suspect it will when you get really high. Uh, but if you're just a few meters off the uh, off the water surface, um, I don't think it will have a huge effect. Um, but yeah, that's something that that could be studied there. I know something um, that I've been looking in, starting to look into is trying to develop a a um, error propagation method within the Seki depth um, uh, technique um, and theory. So you could begin to try to quantify the errors in various aspects uh, and see which ones are most sensitive. Um, but that is not something I've heard anyone do before. So yeah, a little, little study like that, you might find a nice little publication somewhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And another question is, what effect does Seki depth move? phytoplankton or suspended sediment oh what does affect the seki depth more phytoplankton or suspended sediment it's difficult really to answer that because um yeah i mean there it you could get cases it depends where you are in the ocean so if you're out in the open ocean you'd expect phytoplankton to have more of an influence on your uh, second depth um, measurement than uh, not suspended sediments. But if you're in a coastal region, certainly where you've got waves breaking, you've got a lot of material coming out of rivers, it may be very well that the suspended sediments make, make more of an impact. So it depends on, uh, I mean, th this is something that can be studied using optical theory qu quite easily, actually. If you know the optical properties of your sediment and you know the concentrations of your sediment, you know the optical properties of phytoplankton and their concentration concentrations, you can begin to look at the impact on the clarity of the water um, uh, theoretically. Um, but I suspect it will vary depending where you are. Yeah, and a related question. Chlorophyll versus Seki depth has a correlation. What if both turbidity and chlorophyll is high? 
what would be the correlation? Great question. So um, the correlations that we were showing there were very specific to the open ocean. Um, so in those cases, um, we can make a reasonable assumption that the optical properties of the water co-vary with the phytoplankton. If you get cases like I'm assuming we're talking about here, where you have high phytoplankton, high sediments, you're probably in uh, what they call case two waters or more optically complex waters. And in those waters, you typically find that phytoplankton and these sediments do not co-vary in a predictable manner. Um, so you need to be very careful when you directly relate your second depth measurement to your phytoplankton abundance. Uh, um, actually, th this is where, in cases like this, it's where the frelt wool colour and the secchi depth um, measurement together can provide you that added bit of information. So if you're making the secchi depth measurement in very green waters, um, you can be a bit more confident probably that the depth is linked to the phytoplankton. But um, if you're looking at very brown waters or greeny brown waters, then, you know, you need to be probably a little bit more careful relating the two directly. Yeah. OK, Urias has another question. What category of water should be called pure water? What if category? Most of, yeah, if most of the light is absorbed in near infrared. What? So, I mean, you can... In terms of water types or categories of water, there's a long history uh, behind this, starting with Zherlov, actually, which was a very famous optical scientist. And more recently, optical water types um, uh, are, are a, a real emerging, not emerging, but a growing field uh, in ocean color theory uh, because they have uh, many different applications, whether that's um, how we manage the waters or whether that's how we tune our algorithms. Um, but pure waters are normally uh, associated with extremely oligotrophic regions where there's really not much in the water at all. So those regions typically encompass what they call the five oligotrophic gyres. There's two in the Atlantic, two in the Pacific, one in the and one in the Indian. Um, and uh, there's uh, some really nice studies actually out there that study have studied these water types, these um, uh, 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 this. They're normally, um, uh, when I think about water types, case one, or they're optical water type zero or one, depending on uh, what technique you're you're using. But yeah, they're the really hyper oligotrophic gyres. Yeah. And Ansi has a question. Does 3D printing cause any change in the RGB values of a few color scale? To be more precise, is there any change in visual color of 3D printed a few color scale versus the Original if you're color scale. Yes. So um, just to clarify that the color scale is not 3D printed. The color scale is just printed directly on a sticker. OK, uh, so the 3D printed filament shouldn't have any effect on the color scale of the sticker. However, the color scale will degrade. So in these packs, we normally provide um, a few of them. Uh, they also may change depending on the printer that you use. So we've been sticking with the RGB values that uh, Marcel Bernard published in his paper. But most printers don't print in RGB. They print in other units, CYMK, something. I can't remember the acronym. Um, but those colors often are slightly less restricted in, in, in exact color than the RGBs. Uh, and so you need to convert your RGBs into this other printable color scale. And that conversion sensitive and also uh, the printers then are, are sensitive. So you do need to be a bit careful about the color scale. I th the only thing I would say is it um, uh, it is a crude estimate of color. So it is a I mean, we've done tests with this with the the, the sticker and we typically find um, amongst a number of groups of people uh, making the measurement uncertainties of one to 1 1.5 uh, in the color itself. Uh, so it is a crude measurement of color. So um, uh, just be a, be cautious of that. And if it starts and to look like it's fading, it needs to be replaced. Yes. And Varunan has a question, uh, not a question, more of a statement. Water body has only Phytoplankton or suspended sediments or a mixture of both. Uh, I, I don't think I understood what he meant. I'm not entirely sure either, uh, but um, a water body will consist of 
uh, a series of the water itself and a number of constituents or what they call optically active constituents in that water. Oh, um, yeah. Here comes the question. What affects the sicky depth more? Phytoplankton or suspended sediment? I thought I think that's a similar question to that yes. I answered. Uh, uh, yeah, earlier. you answered it earlier. Yeah. yeah. And we. this is the last question by Ari Ful Hussein. Is there any algorithms for converting in situ chlorophyll A to phytoplankton concentration? If any articles what? are available, please suggest. Okay, I can't think of anything off the top of my mind. Uh, so I think you need to be a bit careful what you mean by concentration there. So uh, chlorophyll A concentration is often used as a proxy for phytoplankton abundance. I mean, it can vary independently of phytoplankton abundance through through photoacclimation and processes like that. Um, we can also get a measure of phytoplankton abundance by counting the cells um, uh, in the water. And so a lot of people have looked at the relationship between chlorophyll and cell counts, but they're all, that's also quite complicated as well. And then we can get other measures of phytoplankton abundance, uh, like the carbon biomass, uh, which is actually in many ways a nice proxy of phytoplankton uh, biomass or abundance, uh, but it also has a lot of issues. Chlorophyll is quite nice because it's relatively easy to measure and it's directly related to phytoplankton, whereas carbon um, uh, you get in other particles in the water. Yeah, and last question, whether the light intensity affects the Seki measurement reading? Whether the light intensity yeah, maybe the time of the day. Yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of people have studied that, actually, and there's a lot of really nice papers out there. They do find that it does make have an effect. Uh, one of the things I've noticed, we collect these measurements all down the Atlantic, is that your, your eyes themselves are very good at adapting to the ambient light environment. So, uh, for instance, you can see this when you uh, they talk about playing chess in different light environments. You can... Your uh, um, light, your eyes adjust to the contrast in um, a light between the white uh, squares and the black squares in very light environment or, very, or quite dark environment. And it's a similar thing with the Seki disc because you're looking at a contrast in light between the disc and um, the background uh, uh, water. Um, so it's not as sensitive as one may immediately think. Um, However, there is an effect, uh, absolutely, and scientists have shown that in, in cases. Thank you. So we are running late, actually. So I would, yeah, I I would request Brinson to say the concluding remarks to thank Bob. Yeah, uh, yeah, Loka. Yes. Loka, ma'am. Do you have? Yeah. 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 I just wanted to say. Uh, I enjoyed listening to the talk, especially the miniaturization part, because I belong to a very miniature world, the microbes. I just want to know, will there be a day where you can measure the autofluorescence in um, marine bacteria? You know, the photosynthetic bacteria, that is number one. And then what about uh, measuring uh, uh, genes when you auto, uh, what you measure now is autofluorescence. Will there come a day when you can measure the tagged fluorescence in the genes? Well, I'm, this is futuristic. I'm just asking mm -hmm. a question. Uh, will you be able to reach that uh, point where the microbes, microbiologists also can participate in remote sensing data? <laughs> These are great questions. Um, really nice questions. I think the first thing to say is our ideas around the... Um, sensing secchi disc so this last slide that i showed where we begin to integrate sensors in and that, yes i saw in the previous question some talk about upward facing light sensor we are testing that as well at the moment so i thought i'd just jump in there but the idea is to use potentially the disc as a platform right so as and when new sensors are developed um they could potentially be integrated into into that platform um, so we haven't got that far ahead. <laughs> Whether we will get that far ahead is another matter. But uh, we've been thinking certainly about around conductivity, which is uh, there's a lot of movement in the uh, open source world around producing uh, open CTDs. 
So cheap, low cost CTDs and a lot of progress in conductivity sensors around that. Um, also, fluorescence based sensors within the SOCOM project uh, um, uh, that PI Phil Breslin's uh, leading. Uh, we are looking at um, developing low cost fluorescence based sensors, targeting chlorophyll fluorescence rather than the kind of fluorescence that you're you're uh, alluding to with the bacteria um, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and also the fluorescence of other materials in the water, be it uh, dissolved substances or, or um, uh, bacteria pollution related substances. Um, also, there is a lot of development as well um, going on with producing very low cost water sampling kits as well. So it could be a point where um, it doesn't have to be on a mini secchi disc, it could be on a completely different device, but one could collect water and um, fix it very easily uh, and then send it easily to these laboratory based systems that can study those kind of things. There is a lot of exciting developments, I would say, in uh, these sort of DNA um, uh, uh, metagenomic based uh, autonomy. Uh, often you're looking at the very high end uh, on the technology side rather than the low cost, low end uh, uh, tech. Um, so there are developments in that field. So maybe, I hope so, whether in my lifetime or not. <laughs> It will definitely be in your lifetime. I'm hoping for it. <laughs> I'd love to use it in small bodies of water, especially a miniature uh, gadgets, you know. Yeah. It's very good uh, in small bodies of water where the microbes uh, fluoresce a lot. That's interesting. Uh, and often yeah. the concentrations, excuse me, are much higher as well in those small water bodies, aren't yes, they? So it yes, might be a bit yes, easier yes. to get at that information. You have a great, you have a great chance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today, today we, have, we are joined with panelists, uh, uh, Lee also, Lillian Krug, and uh, Vivian also. Would you like to Would you like to say something? I'm sorry, I'm a little bit lost. Are you seeing my screen? I have to stop sharing. Yes, yes. Yeah, we are, we are seeing okay. it. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say thank you to Bob. It was a great presentation as always, very illustrative. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Lika has been sharing all the links related to Trevor Blood Science Foundation. Please look into the chats. Okay, then uh, we have Vivian also with us. Vivian, would you like to speak no. something? Yeah, no, Vivian, Vivian shifted to being an attendee, saying oh. that her internet connection is unstable. Okay, okay. Thank you, Bob, for the wonderful presentation as usual. And uh, Bob is in a constant pursuit of improving the secure disks, which started with Mini, Mini. Now he's trying to incorporate sensors uh, with the turbidity measurements and the color measurements. He wants to incorporate the... Uh, very important other senses such as temperature sensor and uh, pressure sensor. He's he and his brother both are in pursuit of improving it. Um, it's a very good uh, uh, way of improving science because with uh, as Bob was telling, with small equipments can do wonders because this, this can be in multiple in number and we can have citizen science network as he was explaining in my paper so that it can go way around in amazing large amount of data, the type of data sets he was discussing in the presentation, it was wonderful. And we are also a small partner of Bob doing a small job in Mempanat Lake. Thanks, Bob, for the wonderful presentation. I know he's pretty busy with his uh, uh, Exeter schedule and uh, <laughs> somehow he could excuse sometime when there was much request coming from the audience themselves after the Trevor Symposium, which happened in Plymouth quite recently. Many people are interested in this topic. And I can see the genuine interest in the interactions they had with the number of questions which was uh, reflected in the question answer box section after the presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for the wonderful presentation. And uh, this indeed has been a teamwork. Uh, I am seeing that the the torch Dr. Shubha is bearing in taking us towards the light which Trevor showed initially. It is going really into the different parts of the world, seeing the type of attendees which attended this. I think if uh, 57 participants attended, I think uh, they will be from at least 30 countries. So 
that's the type of global reach we have and uh, remaining mostly from india <laughs> so thanks for the projects we are having here uh, i thank uh, lika constantly for the social media campaign she is doing and uh, the type of database she is having so that we all get connected and get engaged and uh, i thank i think lydia is also joining this program for the communications she had with all of you thank you nandini ma'am for hosting the uh, webinar today i was bit busy to join because uh, here it's late hours at the office and uh, i am still at office so uh, it, it was bit tight for me to join from one meeting to this thanks nandini for hosting this webinar and uh, uh, really making it possible even though bob agreed there should be some mechanism by which this should happen so she was behind it thank you nandini ma'am so thank you all for organizing it Real yes pleasure. it's a pleasure it's a pleasure we would love to hear more from you and i thank all the participants it's a good number of participants this is one of the excellent number of participants we had uh, in this webinar series around 57 58 people i have seen still there are 40 participants despite the lengthy question and answer session and the type of thanksgiving we are doing now still the people are staying back we wish that this is taken to further ends and if any of you who have joined this program they want to give a lecture on uh, the topics related to what is associated with the trevor platt science foundation please go and see trevor platt science foundation website also there are exciting opportunities also uh, so that uh, you can utilize them at the same time if uh, some of you are interested in giving a webinar please let us know so that we can take it forward uh, thank you lok bharati ma'am for joining with us as a panelist thank, thank you. you have a nice time